It's always good to obey God 100%. Would you agree? Amen. There's nothing worse in life, nothing worse in the life of a believer than kind of going halfway in with God. You know, that's a good rule to live by anyways. It's, it's not good to go halfway in on anything. I mean, can you imagine how long you'd keep a job if you were only halfway in? Can you imagine a marriage that was only halfway in? My wife gets mad at me when we're on dates because if I check my phone for a text or a message, I'm not really there. Come on. My son's got a playoff football game today, and I guarantee you I'm not going to be halfway there. You will hear me screaming and yelling, whatever voice I've got left. It will be completely gone by the time this game is over. Why? Because they need to hear the preacher shout and scream at the other team. But you don't want to be halfway. Halfway gets you in trouble with anything. Halfway with your grades. Halfway with your relationships. Halfway with your job. It doesn't make any difference with God. God has always worked that way. You cannot go halfway in with God. He's an all or nothing kind of a God. It's been that way from the beginning. God has a funny way of making sure that you don't go halfway with him. If you do, you'll be in trouble. Now, to start this thing off, I want to kind of give you a background. When God decided to establish a people here on this earth, he made a covenant with an old man and an old woman. He said, look, you're going to have a baby. Yeah, all right, we're pushing 100. Ain't going to happen. God's always got a funny way of making sure that he gets all the glory. And when it looked like the covenant was going to be sacrificed, God delivered a way out. Then God delivered as a family began to grow. He established the covenant while these people were slaves in Egypt. He delivers them from a famine, puts them into Egypt. Everything is going good. All of a sudden, a new pharaoh comes in. They become slaves for several hundred years until the time comes for them to be delivered. So they walk in as a family. They walk out as an army. And God once again establishes that he is God. Those are his people. Don't mess with them. And so he delivers them through the Red Sea. Can you imagine what it would have been like walking through that Red Sea, seeing the walls of water on both sides of you? See, a lot of people want to be delivered, but they don't realize how scary the deliverance could be. So he delivers them. And there's fire and there's clouds and everybody can see it. You got to understand, as they're moving and marching for 40 years, not only does Israel see the fire and the smoke, but all the enemies see the fire and the smoke. So God is establishing, we're coming, ready or not, here we come. And as long as you keep my rules, you keep my covenant, it's going to be all good. Here's the rules, you do your part. And here's the deal. I'll give you vineyards you didn't plant. I'm going to give you homes you didn't build. Uh, I'm going to drive out everybody in the land. Everybody will know you're my people. You'll be blessed for generation upon generation. And I will be your God ruling from my temple. All you've got to do is obey me. Pretty easy deal. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out that way. And a generation rose up that did not remember the things of God, that did not honor the ways of God, and rejected the rule of reign of God in their lives. So God sent judges to come in. Israel would get in trouble. A judge would come in and redeem them. They'd repent. They'd move forward in God. Then they'd mess up again. Another judge comes on the scene. Hundreds of years of judges, repentance, judgment, back and forth, until God finally establishes kingship. People ask for it, they get it. It only lasts about 160 or so years where Israel is united under one king. Then it splits and the devil divides the house of God. Once division takes place in the kingdom of God amongst God's people, it does not take long for half the kingdom to be wiped out. 
A house divided against itself will never stand. That's why you got to be careful who you allow to divide the house of God. Because anybody that caused division in the house of the Lord, come on, come on now. has got to be kicked to the curb. They don't do what they were supposed to do. Pastor Kobe, what are you talking about? When they went into the promised land, it was very, very simple. They were supposed to drive out everybody in the land. They were supposed to kill everything. It's called a holy war. By the way, what's happening with ISIS right now is a holy war. For thousands of years, this is how they have conducted war. There is no politician, whether you're elected for four or eight years, that's going to change thousands of years of an understanding. Are you with me? Yeah. It's not going to happen. I love that, the picture. You know, if Reagan was still president, ISIS would be was was. <laughs> Have you seen that? It's not going to change thousands of years of a holy war. Why? Because if they won't convert you, they will kill you. God says to Joshua, when you go into the land, I'm not going to give you everything at once because then they'll overtake you. I'm going to drive them out little by little. Some kind of like you get a 16-year-old when they get their first car. You don't get them a Mercedes. You get them a Mazda. Come on. Yeah. It's not a Ferrari. It's a Fiat. But you don't go and get them all the way in, right? God says, I'm not going to give you everything because you can't handle it yet. But drive them out. And as soon as they do not do what they were supposed to do, all of a sudden, they got in trouble. Oh, but we're just going to keep them, God. They're going to be our slaves. Okay. Okay. Weeds in the harvest of destiny. And eventually, what they were supposed to kill became embraced. And because they were trying to live in two worlds and do it their own way, eventually... Instead of influencing the world around them, they became influenced by their disobedience. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. It's hundreds and hundreds of years. A little further away from God. A little further away from God. A little further away from the covenant. And God finally had enough. When God brings judgment on his people, it's not to punish them. It's always to bring them to repentance. And so God comes in, raises up an empire from Babylon to come in and destroy what is left of Israel and what's left of the kingdom. And through several deportations, they take the best of the best and bring them to Babylon to integrate them into their culture and their society and fully indoctrinate them in their paganism. Several deportations. Unfortunately for Jeremiah, he kept trying to get deported, and he's stuck. That's why we have lamentations. If you're ever depressed, don't read that book. <laughs> Ezekiel is one of them. Daniel's another, his famous three friends. And while the whole world is thrown upside down, Israel feels like God has abandoned them. Their homeland is destroyed. Their temple is ruined. The signs of the presence of God being with them is completely destroyed. It is there that a young son of a priest, a young Levite, becomes a prophet. And there, by the rivers of Babylon, he sits down. And there he wept as we remembered Zion. Remember the song? It wasn't Bob Marley. Actually, the Psalms. So it's there by the rivers of Babylon. He has a frightening vision. And this is what it looked like. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. 
Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the voice of the Lord. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, and say to it, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Not only did they stand up as a vast army as he prophesied to those bones, it also says further in Ezekiel 37, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up. Our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it, declares the Lord. Let's talk about these bones for a moment. These bones, these bones. We sing the song as a children, there's bones and bones and dry bones, right? We learn as a kid, but we don't fully understand what's going on. The man of God, Ezekiel, standing there in exile, thinking that all hope is gone, is taken to a frightening vision in a valley where these bones are dead. Now you've got to understand, as God's taking him in this vision, he's walking around, defiling himself amongst these bones. And he looks and he says, these are so bones, I can't count them. I don't understand what's happening with them. I don't know completely where they've come from, but these aren't just dry. These are very dry bones. These bones represented the house of Israel. Those who have died, not just in the exile, but those who have died spiritually as well. So while we're so worried about America over the last several decades walking away from God, Israel walked away from God for centuries. And he was about to have them observe the Shemitah, because they did not participate in it for 70 years. They will be in exile so that they can get rest and learn once again how to depend on God. But these people were completely cut off from God's presence. Friends, can I tell you this right now? That I believe that not only was this prophetic for Israel at that time, but I believe this is a prophetic word for the church here in America today that we have been dried up, we are dry bones, and we are stuck in a valley. And a lot of us can't remember what it was like to actually feel the presence of God flowing through us. We have been cut off from his presence. We have been cut off from his goodness, cut off from his glory, and we have been as dry bones lying in the desert. No longer do we feel the life inside of us. What did Jesus say? He says, out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. We also know the Bible says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eat or drink, but righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus said, my food is to do the work of the kingdom. Friends, we have had spiritually dehydrated Christians and spiritually anorexic Christians who no longer know how to worship God so they have no hydration of the Spirit in their life. And because they are no longer wanting to do the work of the kingdom, we are malnourished. But friends, it's time that we start going back to praising God, back to getting involved in the things of God. And unless this happens, we will continue to be dead and dry in this land. There's a reason we are being hunted and killed right now. How many more people, do, I guarantee you this, if it was Muslims that were hunted out and shot in Oregon, it would be all over the news right now. But because they're Christians and the church refuses to do anything about it, we might as well be a bunch of dry bones. What causes dehydration? 
What causes us to be spiritually dehydrated? A lot of it is discouragement. Discouragement to dishearten, to remove confidence. Discouragement. Discouragement is one of the most wicked tools that the enemy will ever place against the church. Now, discouragement is the opposite of encouragement. Encouragement is not flattery. So a lot of people think encouragement is flattery. It's not flattery. Encouragement actually means to stimulate spiritually or to inspire. And if the devil can take that stimulus from you, then he can defeat you. There's a fun story about the devil. He decided to have a grog sale once. And he decided to sell all the weapons in his arsenal. He wanted to sell them to one of his sinister creatures that would continue on in his wicked plan. So he saw one day walking up his driveway, a hideous creature looking at him. The demon walked over to the devil and said, I want to be the next enemy of the world. So the devil took him through his yard cell and began to show him all that he had for sale. He went by and saw weapons like lust, weapons of worry, weapon of envy, one of religion, one of tradition. The creature saw these and said, my goodness, what wonderful and powerful tools these would be in the hands to stop the work of God in the earth. But the devil turned to this dark angel with a smile on his face and said, yes, these weapons have been used wonderfully. And yes, of course, they have accomplished the work that I've wanted them to do. But I want you to see the weapon I've used most to bring down nations and to cause people to give up serving God and to stop great things from happening in the world. And as this creature awaited, wringing his hands anxiously to see this vile weapon, the devil reached back into a corner and pulled out a weapon that was written on top of it, discouragement. And this devil presented this weapon of discouragement before him, saying, by this weapon I have toppled kingdoms. I have stopped the people of God that were excited about him, and I have stopped them dead in the tracks. By this weapon, I have stopped people that have made a good start with God, I have made them give up and lose hope and lose heart. By this weapon I have conquered, and by this weapon I have overcome more than any other weapon in my arsenal. And by this weapon, you can well continue the work that I have begun. Discouragement will rot your bones. They will dry you out. If the devil will discourage you, then you're not going to pray because what's the use? God doesn't hear me anyways. He'll keep you from reading the Bible because what's the use? God won't speak to me. He'll get you to not pay your tithe or give your offerings because I can barely make it now. You'll reject what the preacher's saying because this guy doesn't live in reality. You'll look at what everybody else is doing and not look to Jesus. And you won't come to church because there's just a bunch of hypocrites there anyway. You know what? Not going to church because there's hypocrites is like not going to the gym because there's overweight people there. Come on. Come on. Discouragement will stop you dead in your tracks. Can I tell you this morning? The Bible says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The Bible says that you are above, not beneath. You're in the head, not the tail. You are not just going to win, but you are more than a conqueror. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ Jesus. You've got encouragement today knowing that the power of the Holy Ghost, the same one that raised Jesus from the dead, is living inside of you, ready to work at your fingertips if you will just buy in. Be encouraged with that. You know another thing that dries up our bones? It's sin. Now I'm not talking about sin in the sense of the vileness. I'm not talking about sin where you're completely backslided. I want to take another step in sin. This may mess your theology up. Sin, we know, is to miss the mark, right? It's a word picture that we have where you're shooting a bow and arrow and you miss the target. What's the target? The target is the standards that God wants you to live up to. I believe a lot of Christians are sinning in their life because they are falling short of God's best. And they're living an almost life instead of an utmost life. And when God has called you to live here, you're settled to live here. And so you are missing the mark that God set for you. And you've fallen back with, well, it's okay. I'm content being where I'm at. Almost, not utmost. 
I want to lay hold of everything God has for me. And I don't want to leave anything on the table. Now, I'm not saying this prosperity this and prosperity that and God's going to give you diamond rings and blah, blah, blah. What I'm saying is this. If God has something for me, he's got something for me for a purpose and a reason. It's not so that I can walk through life and not have any issues. God is laying treasures up so I can be a blessing for somebody else. If he's got miracles, it's not for me. It's for somebody else. Are you with me? I'm not going to be greedy about the things and the gifts of God. God's blessings have nothing to do with greed. Come on. But let me, let me just say it this way. Naomi, five kids. Would you be happy if three of them served the Lord? Well, but you did pretty good. Three out of five is okay. Are you happy with three out of five? Absolutely not. You know why? Because you care. So why do you leave things on the table? When I go and take my family to Legoland, I take both my kids. I go with both of them. I come home with both of them. It doesn't do me any good to say, you know what? I brought one of the two home. That's good enough. Why would I leave something that God has attached to me? And I think a lot of Christians sin by living an almost life instead of living an utmost life. And you're settling down here when God's called you to greater things. And you're leaving souls on the table. Come on. Souls, people waiting on the other side of your obedience because you don't want to be disrupted right now. Because you don't want to be bothered right now. Because it doesn't quite look the way you want to look. Well, if God tells you to walk through some dry bones and it may be dirty and you may be defiling yourself, but if God sets you there, don't miss any moments. A lot of us sin. Because we don't live to our full potential. And when you do that, your life is hopeless. I know somebody right now was making good money, good looking. Had everything at his fingertips. Girl wants to marry him. Begging for the ring. Inside, he's dead. He'll even say that. I feel dead. Because there's no hope. And his bones are dry. And I don't know how many are here saying, Pastor, I just feel dead inside. I feel dead. That's why I love what God says. Son of man, can these bones live again? Christianity was never about making you happy. It was about making you holy. We don't do this Christianity thing to give you life skills to move forward. Christianity has always been about waking the dead. Can these bones live? In other words, son of man, do you see what I see? I know what you're walking around looks like it's just death. I know it looks like there's no hope. I know what used to be in there isn't there anymore. But do you see what I see? I see an army. I see my people ready to move forward. Do you see what I see? God is not looking for you to just say it like it is. God's looking for you to declare what could be. And if all you see is death and bones dying around you, you're going to miss the moment. God is looking for canned people. He's looking for people who don't focus on the problem. They focus on the potential. Do you see what I see? And at least the man of God is smart enough to say, uh, I don't know. I think this is a trick question. <laughs> oh, God, you know that. So what does God say? Prophesy. Do you have the vision to see what could be and are you willing to declare it? See, a lot of people are declaring bad things over your life. You're not prophesying. It's not prophetic. It's pathetic. You speak in death over your marriage. You speak death over your finances. You speak death over your children. When it's time, you need to drink big. It's time that you think big. If you come to my house, you'll hear this every single day. You are great. There's greatness in you act like it. You may be acting the fool right now, but there's greatness inside of you and I will not let you live at that level because Jesus died for you and as long as you are in my house, I will speak life. You may make poor decisions, but I'm going to keep the word of God in your face. I will keep it over your, I'm going to pray that spirit off of you. Because I'm not going to speak death over my children. I'm not going to speak death over our marriage. And there's been some dark moments. But I'm going to tell you, if not for the grace of God, bringing in new life to dead bones, we wouldn't even be here right now. Come on. Prophesy. Speak it. Your miracle is in your mouth. 
Will you declare it or will you just say it like it is? Listen, Ezekiel didn't need to tell God there's just a bunch of bones. He needed to see what could be. And as soon as he spoke, let the weak say, I am strong. Sometimes you need to prophesy over yourself. And as soon as he speaks the word, what happens? The bones begin to quiver and the bones begin to shake. It's as if they said, did you feel that? I feel somebody who's actually speaking a word from God. And as the bones begin to snap together, it's almost as if they're saying, did you feel that? Did you feel the son of God flow by me? I haven't felt that in a long time. And bone snapped a bone and begin to connect again. Your deliverance is going to come through your connection. Who God connects you to and who you're bound with when God puts your life back together again, it's called structure. See, when the devil gets a hold of you and you become discouraged and hopeless and your spirit dries out, everything in your life falls apart. That's when God puts you back together again through the connections and it provides the structure in your life that you need to have. Are you with me? But not only does you rest with just the bones snapping back in place because structure is good, but it's not complete. A structure just gives you the skeleton. I need to have some systems put into place. I need my circulatory system, my respiratory system. I need all these systems functioning together because if those systems aren't in place, the processes by which we do things, your life won't matter. What can move the structure like a system? If I don't have a muscle, I can't move the bone. But a lot of people stop with the structure. And they stop with the system. And they forget they need the wind of God. The bones slap together. The skin grows back, but it was still lifeless. Because you'll always be lifeless without the Holy Ghost. And I love what this is. I love what this is. Prophesy now to the wind. To the wind? You mean don't prophesy from heaven? Are you telling me this spirit was there the whole time? Are you telling me that this was coming from the four winds? It was here all the time and we just didn't know it? Prophesy to the wind. And as he prophesied, the wind began to blow and it filled their lungs, filled it to capacity. And when that Holy Ghost hit, they stood up, not dead, not farmers, not peasants. They stood up as an army. Now, I don't know what happened when they died, but when God breathed new life into them, they were enlisted in the army of God and they were ready for battle. I want to talk to a church today that's had the wind knocked out of them. Life will punch you in the gut and the wind will get knocked from you. You'll wake up by life and all of a sudden the wind's knocked out. You get pink slipped at work and the wind's knocked out of you. Friends, it's time for that wind to blow back in your life. Let the Holy Ghost flow through you and those bones and bones, them dry bones will live again. Oh, prophesy to the wind. That is something that I believe needs to happen in this generation. If I can have the worship team to come back. I believe the wind has been knocked out of our generation. And it's time to call for the wind to come back. This is prophetic in nature. Some of you who are so dry, you're not just dry, you're very dry. You don't even remember what life was like before. You've been dead so long, you don't even remember. It happens. It does. It doesn't mean you're bad. You just need the prophet to declare something over you. Some of you are in the position of the prophet. All around you, you see death. But can you see what God sees? Are you willing to declare what it could be, or are you too busy to say it like it is? See, I don't need any more people to tell me like it is. 
I've got enough people in my life to tell me what they give me a piece of their mind. Let's get real. Problem with giving people a piece of your mind, pretty soon you've got no brain left. <laughs> I'm looking for people who are canned people. I'm looking for people who say, oh, I see bones. I can't wait to see that miracle. I'm looking for the potential to be called out of somebody, not just focusing on the problem. Let's stand to our feet. How many of you would all look at me and say, Pastor, I've had the wind knocked out of me. Unexpected divorce. Unexpected child. Loss of a job. A bad choice. A bad choice somebody else made that's impacted you. We had a kid fall asleep at the wheel, hit us last year, if you remember. To this day, I still bear the pain of that kid. I can whine about it. Or I can move on. See, if I keep holding on to the past, I can't reach into the future. And I may walk with a limp, but at least my name's changed to something else. What about you? Who would wave at me and say, Pastor, I've had the wind knocked out of me and I need a fresh feeling? Just wave at me. Here's what I'm going to do. Shalom's going to lead us in that song. This morning as I was studying, I felt the Lord tell me to symbolically release the wind. It may be strange to you, but that's okay. The Bible's full of strange things. And know my heart. But I believe the Lord wants me to say, those of you who had the wind knocked out of you, today is your chance to be filled once again. So let's close your eyes. If you have had the wind knocked out of you, and you need to be filled again, just wave at me. Keep your eyes closed. I want you focusing on the Holy Spirit right now. Just wave, just wave, just wave. So, Father, as these hands are raised, I ask that you come in and that you send the wind of your Holy Spirit one more time to come and bring them and in filling like they never have had before. Let these dry bones come together. Bring the systems. Bring the systems. Bring the tissue. And now bring life in the name of Jesus. Send your Holy Spirit now. 